Good morning. Uh, I am uh, Donato Yocha. I am the uh, Tokamak Cooling Water System section, section leader. And this is a general uh, talk about uh, the ITER Tokamak Cooling Water System. As you can see here already on the title of my talk, this is a rather peculiar system because in addition to be a cooling water system, it is actually also a heating system. And more details on this will, uh, will follow. So again, this is a general talk. I will give uh, an introduction uh, and status of, of the project related, of course, to my system. Then there is a slide which is actually focusing on the peculiarities of the Tokamak cooling water system, which actually make this a first of a kind system. And then there is the core of the presentation, which is a, a general functional analysis of the Tokamak cooling water system. On the picture in this slide, uh, you see a, a view, a general view of the either Tokamak cooling water system. In this system, we have many subsystems, and three of them are the main subsystems, actually. We have the vacuum vessel primary heat transfer system. The main function of this system is to cool and bake, provide hot water to heat up the vacuum vessel. We have what we call the IBED primary transfer system, which is there to cool and bake the in-vessel components which are basically the first wall blanket modules and the diverter cassettes. And finally, we have the MBI, primary transfer system, which is there to cool the neutral beam injectors. In addition to these three main systems, we have uh, uh, what we call auxiliary or supporting subsystems. First of all, we have the chemical and volume control systems, which are there to control the water chemistry and water volumes of the main subsystems. We have the drying system, which is there to dry out prior to long-term maintenance, the in-vessel components and the vacuum vessel. And we have the draining and refilling system, which is there in order to provide draining to the main systems prior to maintenance and refilling of the main systems once the maintenance is uh, um, finished. The Tokamak cooling water system is uh, completely located in the uh, Tokamak building, uh, in the nuclear building of the ITER uh, machine. The design and procurement of this uh, system is the responsibility of the United States Domestic Agency, and the design and procurement is managed in two main phases. We have a first phase, which is focused on providing what is functionally needed or captive for construction purposes for force plasma. And we have a second phase, which is focusing for on the delivery and um, installation of the post force plasma systems. This is basically the Tokamak cooling water system inside the Tokamak building. And you can see that it is actually a huge system. It is located all over the place in the Tokamak building, starting from the very low lever, uh, what we call P2, up to the L4 levers. You have in perspective also at the center of the picture the vacuum vessel, which can give you a scale of the whole system. Again, it is actually very, very big. Going level by level, we start from the B2 uh, in the drain tank room, DTR, where we have the main components of the drain systems. You see these uh, three main drain tanks, which are in uh, green. Plus, in the center of the, of the slide, we can see the main components of the vacuum vessel primary transfer system. What are those components? We have a couple of heat exchangers and baking heater, uh, two pumps, and so on. Going a little bit up, uh, we move from B2 to what we call B2M or lower pipe chase, LPC, where we have, uh, I would say, a bunch of piping uh, for the distribution of the water to our clients, together, of course, with supports and uh, many uh, valves. Going a gap in 
up, we arrive directly to the level L3 of the tokamak building, or what we call upper pipe chase, UPC, where again we have many piping and valves in order to distribute the water to our uh, clients. At L4, or what we call vault in the tokamak building, we have instead the main components of different subsystems. We have the main components of the MBI PHTS, we have the main components of the chemical and volume control system, and we have some of the main components of the IBED PHTS. Notably here, you can see in light uh, blue, uh, the pressurizer and uh, um, the volume control tank, the pressure relief tank. Finally, we have the main components of the drying system in red. Going back a little bit to the level L3 on the east side, we have instead the remaining main components of the IBED PHTS, notably the main heat exchangers and the main pumps. In addition to all the piping valves and components which are located outside of the bioshield in Tokamak building, we have a rather big portion of the system also inside the biological shield, notably also inside the cryostat, as you can see in this slide. This is rather straightforward. We need to reach our clients. Our clients are located inside of the cryostat, the vacuum vessel, components, so we have many pipes uh, inside the, uh, the cryostat. There are two peculiarities for the piping inside the cryostat. First, there is no valve and no active component. Why? Well, because maintenance inside the cryostat is a rather challenging task, so in order to minimize occupational radiation exposure, all the main components, including the valves, are kept outside the cryostat. Second, all the piping inside the cryostat is actually a double wall piping. Why? Because in case of a loss of coolant accident, we do not want to spill water directly inside the cryostat for two reasons. The cryostat has not a confinement safety function, and second reason is, of course, for investment protection. Well, in this slide, uh, this is to give, I would say, uh, an overall view of uh, the magnitude of this of this system. All, all in all, we talk about more or less 7,000 tons of equipment, piping, valves, and support, which is a little bit more than 11 Airbus A380, and this is just to give a scale, and the overall piping length of the Tokama cooling water system is a little bit above 43 kilometers. So again, this is a rather huge system, especially when compared to the primary cooling water system of a fission nuclear power plant. So, this is, I would say, a rather provocative slide, huh? because the TCWS, as I said at the very beginning, is actually, in principle, and only in principle, very similar to the primary cooling water system of a fission nuclear power plant. But we do have many peculiar features which actually make this system a first of a kind. First of all, in terms of piping length, as I just explained, we have more than 40 kilometers of piping, while in a normal fission nuclear power plant, we have more or less, actually less, than one kilometer of piping. So it is actually one order of magnitude. The TCWS is one order of magnitude, I would say, a bigger in terms of piping length than the primary cooling water system or fission power plant. In the Tokama cooling water system, as I explained, for all the piping inside the cryostat, we do not have simple pipe, but we actually have double wall, double containment piping. And this is for more or less 20 kilometers of piping. This is not at all the case in fission power plants. Eh? We have some double wall piping in fission fuel fabrication facilities, but the overall length, again, is one order of magnitude less. 
The third very peculiar characteristic of the tokamak cooling water system is that in addition of being a water system, it is also a baking system. It is also a heating system. One of the main functions, as we will see later on, of the tokamak cooling water system is actually to provide hot water and hot gas to our clients in order to heat them up. Why? Because by doing so, we can actually achieve optimal vacuum conditions inside the vacuum vessel. Another very peculiar characteristic of the tokamak cooling water system is that we have a huge number of valves. For many reasons, uh, we have uh, around 3,000 valves, which again is at least one order of magnitude higher than the number of valves we have in a fission power plant. Again, the tokamak cooling water system will be the first primary cooling water system of a nuclear station which is conceived, designed, and optimized in order to work and to extract heat in a cyclic mode. The fission nuclear power plants, even if especially uh, the generation three power plants, are designed in order to cope with some load variation, the optimal working point is, of course, to work steady state at maximum power. Ether, per se, is a parsed machine. The plasma is achieved in parses, which means that the heat load is given to our clients and from our clients to the TCWS in a parsed operation. So, in terms of design, the TCWS is designed in order to comply in order to extract the heat in a parcel operation. And the number of cycles uh, which, are, uh, which is our design target is very big. Uh, we are talking about 30,000 cycles. The last peculiar characteristic of the ITER tokamak cooling water system is that one of our safety function is to strongly limit the mass and energy release in case of a loss of coolant accident. Among those 3,000 valves, a bunch of them have the safety function to close as fast as possible in case of a local loss of coolant accident in order to minimize the mass and energy release to the containment. And now the core of the presentation. What are the main functions of the TCWS? what we need in order to accomplish those functions and what are, I would say, the main points to pay attention to when designing and manufacturing uh, those components. Well, the first and maybe most important function of our cooling system is to extract the heat to cool our clients, so to take away the heat from our clients and release the heat to the secondary cooling water uh, system. What we need in order to do that? Well, of course, we need the piping uh, in order to contain the water and to circulate the water to reach our clients. We need the pumps in order to move the water to make sure that we provide the correct flow rate to our clients. We need valves in order to distribute to our clients the correct flow rate. We have uh, hundreds of clients, uh, starting, for example, from more than 400 first world blanket modules, so we need to have many valves in order to distribute correctly the water to our clients. We need heat exchangers because we need to transfer the heat from our clients to the secondary cooling water system. We need a pressurizer per cooling loop in order to make sure that the pressure is kept at the correct value. And of course, we need a bunch of instrumentation and the corresponding control uh, system. Now, the first component we have in the um, tokamak cooling water system, first big component, is pumps. We have many uh, of them. Huh? The main function of the pump is to assure the correct flow rate uh, for our clients. Actually, in each cooling uh, system, when we have some water flow, we have also pressure drops. So the function of the pump is to counterbalance those pressure drops and to make sure that the water keeps moving at the correct flow rate. When we select a pump, we need to pay particular attention to avoid what we call cavitation. What happens? What happens is that almost 
always uh, in a cooling water system, the lowest pressure point is uh, actually within the pump, just before the pump gives to the fluid the necessary head to counterbalance the pressure drop. So we got to make sure that at the lowest pressure within the system, the pressure remains anyway significantly above the saturation pressure at the operating pressure. If this does not happen, the water can start actually to boil. The desorbed gases in the water can actually develop and we can start with what we call cavitation. If this happens, basically the pump cannot work. So one of the most important thing to make sure we evaluate correctly is really to avoid cavitation. In addition to that, we also need to make sure that the, all the possible incident and accident which can originate because of the pump are duly taken into account in the design of the system. One very important accident to, uh, to take into account is, for example, what we call the pump scissor, which is basically an almost instantaneous stop of the impeller. When this happens, we have an almost instantaneous drop in the flow rate, which means we have actually a water uptake. So we got to make sure that the forces which are generated following the pump seizure are duly taken into account in the design of the piping system. The other important component we have in Tokamak cooling water system and in all cooling water system is valves. We have many valves in TCWS, 3,000 valves, Many of them have the safety function to uh, limit the mass and energy release in case of a loss of coolant accident. From a functional standpoint, the main function of the valves we have, or most of the valves we have, is to assure the correct flow rate to our uh, clients. Also for the valves, we need to make sure that we do not generate any kind of bubbling in the lowest pressure point inside the valve. The valve, per se, has some pressure drop, which means that we have a minimum pressure point within the valve. We need to make sure that there is no bubbling, no vaporization, no dissolved gas release within the valve, because if this happens, the lifetime of the valve is strongly reduced. In addition to that, when selecting a, a valve and the corresponding closure time, we need to make sure that we do not generate significant water under events, or if we do generate significant water under events, we got to make sure that the corresponding forces are duly taken into account in the design of the piping system. One, I would say, challenging example is for the valves, which have the safety function to limit the mass and energy release in case of a lock. From a safety perspective, these valves need to close as quickly as possible because their main function is to limit the mass and energy release. On the other side, if they close too fast, they, can add, they could generate water armors which are too big, maybe, to be taken into account in designing the system. So there is, I would say, a very complex iterative process to arrive to select the, I would say, optimal closure time so that on one side, we limit decrease the mass and energy release in case of a logger, and on the other, we do not generate too big water armor loads. So this kind of iterative process is really important in the design and selection of the closure time for safety important uh, isolation valves. The other big component which we have in the Tokamak water, water system is heat exchangers. We have many of them. Eh? The biggest heat exchangers we have for the IBED uh, PHTS and uh, for the system which is there to cool the in vessel uh, components. The function of these heat exchangers is basically to cool the water so that we can provide the cold water to our clients. The, when the heat is extracted from our clients, vacuum vessel, in vessel components, for example, we got to make sure that this heat is actually given to the secondary cooling water system. So the functional interface between the Tokamak cooling water system and the secondary cooling water system is all those heat exchangers. Those heat exchangers cool the water outside our clients and make sure that the pumps can deliver 
cold water to our clients. We have different typology of heat exchangers which are designed depending on the heat load and temperature difference we need to have. So one of the, of the other components we have in the Tokamak cooling water system is the pressurizer. The main function of the pressurizer is to uh, keep the pressure under uh, control. In the TCWS, we employ what we call a steam pressurizer. This is a pressurizer in which the water is in thermodynamic equilibrium with the corresponding uh, steam. Why we employ this kind of pressurizer? Well, this kind of pressurizer provides a uh, kind of passive control uh, to, the, to the pressure. So, for example, if for any reason the pressure increases, the steam, which is on top of the, in the top part of the pressurizer, naturally condenses. And by doing so, the pressure tends to decrease. So the, the, these components provide a passive response to a pressure increase. If the passive response is not enough, we have a spray on top of the pressurizer, which can further increase steam condensation and further reduce the pressure. If on the other side, for any reason, the pressure decreases, the water, which is in thermodynamic equilibrium with the steam, tends to boil, to evaporate. By doing so, it generates steam, which in turn tends to increase the pressure. So again, we have a passive response of the pressurizer in case, for any reason, the pressure decreases. If this passive response for any reason is not enough, in the bottom of the pressurizer, we have electrical heaters, which can be turned on in order to increase water boiling, which means steam generation, which means pressure increase. In order to accomplish this main function of extracting the heat, we need also a bunch of instrumentation. And we have several hundreds of instruments, which are controlled by our uh, plant and uh, safety uh, control. System. This is a slide which is uh, showing uh, the temperature profile of the water inside the vacuum vessel and we really got to make sure that in each region of the vacuum vessel the temperature of the water and of course the metal remains within acceptable values. The second main function of the uh, TCWS uh, is actually a heating uh, function. Uh, rather, I would say, bizarre for a uh, cooling water system. So we need to provide hot water in order to heat up our clients prior to the plasma in order to achieve optimal vacuum conditions. We need many components in order to accomplish uh, this function. Uh, most of them have been already explained in the previous slides. Two of them are added in this uh, slide. We need to have heaters uh, because we need to heat up the water. And we need to have volume control tanks. Why? Because when we heat up the water from ambient temperature, the water volume increases, the water expands. So we need to store somewhere the excess water. In terms of uh, heaters, uh, we have uh, uh, three uh, heaters in the uh, Tokamak cooling water system. It is, I would say, a rather uh, standard uh, component, which uh, needs any way to be designed very uh, carefully. The most important uh, thing uh, to, uh, to, to pay attention when designing and selecting an heater is to make sure we are really far away from what we call the critical heat flux and departure from nucleate boiling. What, this, well, what is this? When we have an imposed heat flux to a water volume, we have convection in order to evacuate the heat from the heating element and deliver the heat to the water being heated. In the heaters, this heat flux is imposed. If for any reason the heat transfer coefficient is not adequate or the heat flux is too high, we start to have steam formation around the heaters. Then the heat transfer coefficients dramatically drop which means that at a certain point, the heaters, they become completely covered by steam. If this happens, since the transfer coefficients are much lower than what they should be, and the heat flux is imposed, 
the temperature of the heating element increases dramatically, leading to a failure of the heating element. So, correct sizing of <coughs> the heating elements in terms of power and on the other side, correct sizing of the heater per se in terms of heat transfer coefficient is of the, the utmost importance for a proper performance of this component. The other components we need in order to make sure we can heat up our uh, water in order to heat up our clients is volume control tanks. When we tap the water, as said, the water expands and we need to store this water in what we call volume control tanks. We have many tanks in the Tokamak cooling water system in order to do so. Here you can see uh, in this slide two of them. Uh, on the very right side, we have one of our normal drain tanks, which is uh, already installed in the drain tank room of the Tokamak building. And uh, the two pictures on the left side, uh, they show what we call the vacuum vessel primary transfer system volume control tank, which is already installed at the level L4 of the Tokamak building. There are also some, I would say, uh, people eh, to give a sense of scale. We have really huge uh, tanks. The volume of the tank on the right side is more than 200 cubic meters. Uh, why? Because the system, the TCWS, is I would say, a re really big system in terms of water volume, which means that when heat up this water, the excess water which we need to store has a big volume as well. Once the baking function is finished, then we cool down the water. When we do that, the opposite happens and the water volume decreases, the water shrinks, so we need to make sure that we reinject the water from our drain tanks into the system. And this is one of the functions of the draining and refilling system. The third function we have in the Tokamak cooling water system, again, a very peculiar function, eh, because we do not have the same in the primary cooling water system of fission power plants, is to provide hot nitrogen in order to bake the in-vessel uh, components, I should say more to dry out the in-vessel components. Prior, and the vacuum vessel, prior to maintenance, we got to make sure that basically there is no water remaining in our, in our clients. And in order to do that, what we do is basically to heat up our clients by using hot nitrogen. And this hot nitrogen would be basically make the water boiling and or evaporating so that finally, after I would say several tens of hours, our clients are completely dry out. In order to do that, eh, we need many of the components which we need for the other functions, but eh, we have some new components which are introduced in order to accomplish this, uh, this function. We need, first of all, a compressor eh, to circulate the gas. We need the second separators in order to remove most of the water from the gas stream, and we need condensers in order to remove the residual water out of the second separators from the gas stream. Compressor, eh, this is, I would say, a rather standard uh, component, but the peculiarity of the heater Tokamak cooling water system compressor is, first, it is a compressor which will manage radioactive gas, so in terms of sealing, this is rather challenging. It is a compressor which is installed in a nuclear building, so in terms of qualification and load combination, this remains rather challenging. And third, it is a compressor which has several um, uh, performance points. Normally, a compressor is designed in order to work on a, within a rather, I would say, strict range of operating parameters. Our compressor in the ITER Tokamak cooling water system is designed actually to operate in a, what I could say, a wide range of operating parameters. Why? Because the dry out operation is actually a very complex operation during which we have different operating temperatures and pressures of the gas stream. We start from the very first operation, which is the blowout. The blowout is done at a very high pressure and a small flow rates. This is done in order to get rid of the water, which we were not able to, gravi to drain by gravity. Once we get rid of uh, most of the water in our clients with the blowout, 
we start to, to slowly increase the temperature of the nitrogen, we start to decrease its pressure and to increase its flow rate. By doing so, uh, we start to heat up our clients and the residual water which is in our clients up to reach, I would say, a CD state temperature of around 200 degrees. Then the flow rate, uh, pressure and temperature are kept constant and basically we wait uh, the dry out of our clients. After this is done, we slowly decrease the temperatures and pressures in the system. So as you can see, we have different operating points, and this is, I would say, a rather uh, challenging characteristic for the design and selection of the TCWS drying system uh, compressor. The other component we need for drying out our components is a second separator. This is a component which uh, makes sure that most of the residual water within the gas stream is separated. How does it work? The gas stream is basically turning uh, inside this uh, component so that due to the differential centrifugal force, the water droplets are separated by the main gas stream. So we separate at the outlet of this component most of the water, but there is still residual water. And in order to reach a complete dry out of the gas stream, we need the following component, which is uh, the, uh, the condenser, which you can see on the right side of this, uh, of this picture. So the gas stream with some little bit of residual water goes inside the condenser, where thanks to a colder water flow rate, we can condense the residual water within the gas stream so that at the outlet of the condenser, the gas is practically dry. Another function which we have in the Tokamak cooling water system is to make sure that our water chemistry remains in the, our strict uh, ranges and, of course, we minimize corrosion, not only on our pipes, but moreover in, the, in, our, in our clients. So in order to accomplish this function, in addition of, of the many components which we already saw, we have we need mechanical filters in order to make sure that we get rid of solids and particles, especially what we call ACP activated corrosion products. We need demineralizers in order to remove ionic species. We need degasifiers in order to remove dissolved gas in the, in the water. And we need chemical injection in order to inject all the chemicals, notably hydrogen, in order to make sure that our uh, water chemistry is kept under uh, control. This is a, a schematic of a uh, chemical and volume control system with some of the components which, uh, which we need, again, to make sure that the chemistry is within our uh, specification. And in this slide, we want to give an idea of how complex and how much iterative is the design and the design integration of a nuclear cooling water system. You see that we have, I would say, many phases in the design process, but more than that, you can see that many of the phases are iterative. And let me show you just an example of this kind of iterations. First of all, we start with the process design. The process design will evaluate, for example, the pressure drops of the system and select a pump. Once we have a, a process design, which is, I would say, almost completed, we can start the structural qualification, the mechanical analysis of the piping system. What can happen is the following, especially for high temperature cooling water systems like the Tokamak cooling water system, during the mechanical analysis, in order to comply with the thermal load, the mechanical engineers, they can add expansion loops in order to make sure that the piping can, I would say, expand and can be qualified against the thermal load. The point is that by including these expansion loops by the mechanical engineers, those expansion loops, they are adding pressure drops. So once this is done, the mechanical design needs to come back to the process engineers and the process engineers they may they need to recalculate the overall pressure drops 
of the system, which now have increased because of the addition of these expansion loops. And the process engineers, they need to make sure that the pump they selected is still okay. If this is not the case, they need to increase the pump. By doing so, the design is now handed over again to the mechanical engineers, which now they need to make sure that since we have a bigger pumps, the corresponding loads, the corresponding loads coming from the accidents related to a potential malfunction of these bigger pumps are duly taken into account. So you can see that in addition to be a complex, I would say, design process, it is actually an iterative design process. So a few iterations are needed before arriving to a final design and before being authorized to lack procurement and manufacturing of the components. And this is the last slide. Thank you very much for your uh, participation.